So we're about to start the um, Mobile Assistive Technology Innovations Panel. Um, our panel will be sharing knowledge on how we can foster African solutions in assistive technology. It's an honour to be able to introduce Sarah Baston, Accessible Googler Experience, President of Disability Alliance from Google USA, and is the moderator of the Mobile Assistive Technology Innovations Panel. Over to you. Thank you so very much. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to be moderating this section uh, on mobile assistive technology innovations. And I'm even more excited um, to hear what our esteemed panel uh, has to say. So uh, as mentioned, my name is Sarah Basson. Um, I work at Google in New York City in the accessibility and disability inclusion space. Um, I previous, previously, I worked at IBM Research, a variety of careers in accessibility, in speech technology, in uh, education transformation. Um, and my most recent mission at Google involves exploring what Google can do to advance uh, accessibility and disability inclusion and disability advancement in emerging markets, and Africa in particular. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be uh, tightly affiliated with Enable and with inclus inclu Inclusive Africa, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. The goal for today's session is to identify how we can do more to foster uh, African assistive technology innovations. <laughs> Let's make it clear from the start that this is not a solved problem in the United States or in Europe either. Uh, but can we take what we have done in this space and make it available and more importantly, useful in African markets? And so now a number of questions. How do we need to design and modify products so that they're better suited to the needs and conditions of African users versus users in the United States and in Europe? As Google or other US-based companies how do we establish deep relations uh, in the African continent, working with and for the community to provide the right solutions? What are the real needs? We can't assume that, we, that what we already have is what African needs, even if it's translated into African languages, nor can we assume that all the solutions currently available in the United States and in Europe will even work well in Africa. What are the gaps to broadly deploying mobile assistive technologies in Africa? How do we address these gaps or how do we influence others to address them? Or how do we work around them? How do we make sure that local entrepreneurs are supported uh, so that there's more local talent driving local solutions? And with that, I'm going to turn to our panelists uh, who will provide some concrete suggestions around advancing mobile assistive technology innovations in Africa. And first I will invite the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, and so um, if we could start with uh, Bernard if you can provide an introduction, and then I will follow up with questions for the panelists. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bernard Shira. I uh, work out of Nairobi, Kenya, where I lead some work around innovation for assistive technology uh, with the Global Disability Innovation Hub and AMREF Health Innovations. We lead Africa's first assistive tech accelerator that has now produced 22 startups. Uh, and we are um, just getting started to actually bring more innovation uh, in the area of disability. And of course, accessibility is one of our priorities in this work. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Um, uh, Nadav, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, um, hi everyone, it's a real pleasure uh, being here and thank you for the for this great conference all day. So for the Enable team as well, big thanks for what a really educational, inspiring conference. Um, so my name is Nadav Yesod, I'm located in Tel Aviv, Israel. I'm the director for global communities uh, with Tikkun Olam Makers or TAM in short. 
Uh, prior to this, I was the human rights advisor for the permanent mission of Israel to the UN, representing Israel on human rights, which also included, obviously, the uh, topic of persons with disabilities. And also prior to that, representing these issues and advising on them uh, in the Israeli parliament. Uh, so before my life wearing a t-shirt, uh, I actually wore suits. So I made it a point to try not to wear a suit again, hence my uh, t-shirt style, which is very Israeli, and you're all very welcome to, um, to come and visit here. Uh, in short, Tom, or Tikkun Olam Makers, like I mentioned, comes from a very ancient Jewish concept that speaks about um, repairing the world. It's literally the Hebrew translation of repairing the world. Um, and the latter part of our name, Makers, refers to the maker movement and the idea that creating and inventing things by using technology and a hands-on approach is something that is accessible and is something that every society can do. Um, we're a global movement of communities that is dedicated to the creation of solutions um, that are open source, affordable, and accessible for people with disabilities. Um, and we're currently uh, running in about 30 countries around the world including um, in two countries in Africa, and hopefully in many more. Um, so this is kind of a brief, and then we'll kind of touch base later during the questions. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Nadav. And uh, Millicent. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, I'm super excited to be here at the Inclusive African Conference. Um, Millicent Agangeba, a computer scientist and a lecturer at the University of Mines and Technology, Takwa in Ghana. And also I'm the executive director of Inclusive Tech Group. Inclusive Tech Group, our mission wants to develop, enhance and advocate for affordable assistive technologies for persons um, with disability and other vulnerable groups as well. So we look at researching into the digital space to understand the needs of persons with disability so that we can help build their capacities. This afternoon, I'm wearing a tapas green um, top or petticoat. And then the dress is also tapas green with brown. I have a beautiful African brown beads also on top. And then I'm having a wig more or less like a curly wig, yeah. So that's how I look this afternoon. Great, so thank you all for your uh, introductions and, and personal descriptions. Um, and now I'm going to move on to questions and we have uh, one question for each panelist to be followed by uh, questions to come from uh, our esteemed audience. Um, so I'll start with uh, Nadav. And uh, Nadav, what needs to happen to encourage and support innovation in mobile assistive technology across Africa? Small question. Should be Small, easy yeah. to answer in a couple it, it, of words. It, no doubt, no doubt. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible and as concise as possible. Um, I'll start in, in this way. Humankind have been, um, been making solutions since the beginning. It is something that we actually, as societies, as we grew, we gave up um, and handed it over to someone else. By handing it over to someone else and not being able to self-manufacture and self-create solutions, we basically also allowed for someone else to choose what will be the solution that we will have access to, which is a huge question because at the end of the day, it's a financial question. Only things that are, make sense in the profit line are the ones that in the end of the day will actually be created. We at Tom see things differently. So we at Tom have a perspective that it shouldn't be just mass production. It shouldn't be just when it's profitable, someone will get a solution. Because what we know is that we believe in the power of people. And we believe that crowdsourcing of solutions is something that can exist and exists in every place. 
So by promoting open source solutions, we're actually allowing for both creation and transfer of solution and knowledge from one corner of the earth to the other, allowing this transfer of knowledge and goes back to your original also comment in the beginning, Sarah, of how we bring, you know, and how companies can actually adapt. It's not just the companies themselves. We see the talent that lies within societies to actually be able to tinker, to customize, to adapt for their own locality uh, is something that really we see um, very importantly. Um, also, the shift has happened, and we've been talking about this throughout the day, the fourth industrial revolution was mentioned several times. And one of the things is that manufacturing capabilities are coming back um, to society um, in the local level. Um, 3D printers, for example, that a decade ago sounded as far-fetched as space tourism, um, today cost approximately, can cost approximately $200. Um, and they exist in almost every engineering lab. So with a simple 3D printer, anyone can become basically a manufacturing point. We at Tom are building the largest repository of solutions for people with disabilities, for their neglected challenges. These are challenges that the market has no interest of. And if there is a solution, because it's such niche, usually the price point is very high. By making it open source, by stripping all these marketing costs and designer costs, we're basically allowing for solutions to be actually affordable. Um, and once they're documented in a proper way, they're also be able to actually be manufactured locally. And I wanna give you a specific example so you can actually kinda uh, understand the scope of what we're talking about. Um, how many colleges and universities with engineering and industrial design um, classes exist today in Kenya alone. Just from very uh, easy Googling, so thank you, Sarah. Uh, the results came out, approximately 20 universities and colleges. Think about, it. these are thousands of students a year that have to do projects. These are thousands of projects that are being created year after year, only to be weighted to be removed from the shelf at the end of the year by the janitor to allow room for the next class. Now think about the other ones. If you attach to each student, a person with a disability, with a neglected challenge, with an unmet need, and have them solve that person's challenge, document that process and document that solution and making it accessible to anyone anywhere, the global impact of a local solution is multiplied by an endless amount. And this is, and, and when we say 20, we're speaking only about Kenya. Think about the entire African continent. So we need to remember that when we harness this talent we can even be so much bigger because it's not just the universities and colleges. Think about all the corporates with engineers with their CSR policies, or more so retirees, people that society have forgotten that they have amazing talent and can be used to create amazing solutions for people with disabilities. So Africa shouldn't be just taking solutions. Africa has the capacity and ability to actually create solutions and be the engine for solutions for the entire world. So our call today is actually to make these things, to make these processes happen. Engage your universities, your colleges, your corporates, your societies, and your communities. Harness the talent that it really exists everywhere document the solution, digitize it. By digitizing the solution, you're providing power to others and far in the farthest corners of the earth. This is the bold vision. It's not just for Africa, it's a bold vision for the world. It's a scale up idea that really can transform 
entire societies. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate further um, in the follow-up questions. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Nadav. Uh, and uh, moving on uh, to our next question, uh, to Millicent. Um, what are the challenges that you feel are being experienced by assistive technology developers in Africa? And how do you think we can handle that? Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah, for the question. Um, this question is huge, but I'm gonna try to, you know, summarize it. Okay. I, well, you know, in a, a, on a continent where um, statistics show that just about 15 to 17 percent of persons with disability who need assistive technology have access, and um, even in some countries as low as two percent have access. One would think developing assistive technology should be very, very good venture. But unfortunately, it's not. It's not. And um, these are some of the challenges that I feel that um, developers are encountering. Um, first of all, we have the issue of expertise. So there is a lack of expertise. And I lack of expertise to ensure that we're able to provide or produce safe and it, efficient assistive technology or product. Partly, I will blame this on the little research that we do in assistive technology on the continent and even particularly in Ghana, there is little research ongoing on assistive technology. And so because of the nature of assistive technologies, they are very much evolving. Um, without much research, we are not able to match up to the rest of the world. Again, the lack of funds or inadequate funding is also a very big challenge for developers here. Uh, many a times you realize that developers in Africa, and let me be more specific, like in Ghana here, tend to focus only on the soft work when it comes to the city technology. Anything that requires the hardware becomes difficult because you have to import that, the cost involved, and so on and so forth. There are no funds. And so people tend to design one and the same thing over and over again. It's, it's a big challenge here. And also one challenge has to do with the design reality gap. So we designed, it's there and the reality is also aside, okay? Um, at the end of the day, what we need is to give products that are appropriate, okay? Technologies that are appropriate for persons with disability within our context. So take, for instance, in Ghana here, disability issues are always context specific, but there is lack of quality data on persons with disability. And so you cannot tell nor categorize the various uh, disabilities and the numbers involved and the kind of uh, assistive technologies that they need so that um, developers can harness on that to make sure whatever they produce, they get a market for it. Eventually you can produce a lot and it becomes obsolete because there is no quality data. Developers are not well informed. Again, also I feel issue of sustainability is a challenge for developers, how to sustain uh, the assistive technology business. Many people, especially in Ghana here, have the notion of develop and donate. You know, persons with disability are poor, they don't have money. When you develop, you have to donate it. And if you always develop and donate, how are you going to sustain such a business? And so it becomes another challenge. But then overall, I will push most of this challenge to the lack of proper standards, perhaps what I say strategy or a legal framework regarding assistive technology in Ghana and most of African continent. And so there are no guidelines to follow. Um, say the organizations or other stakeholders don't see the need. They don't even understand the need for assistive technology. The assistive technology is the one that gives that equal playing field for persons with disability because there is no um, lay down policy on assistive technology. 
And so let's say, for instance, when you look at France, for example, outside there in the developed world, um, you realize that conscious effort have been made towards assistive technology. And so if somebody is developing assistive technology, a share of the market, everything that you buy on the market, there is a certain minimal percentage that you are paying towards assistive technology. In that regard, they are able to have subventions and make sure it's affordable for people. And so developers are assured of a market, but this is not the case here in Ghana and in most African countries. So the lack of policy framework is also a very, very big challenge. But then to talk about how best we can resolve some of this, uh, I think that uh, first of all, we, we need and governments need to make conscious effort to put in place assistive technology uh, strategy whether in terms of the subvention, how it should be developed, investing in assistive technology research, ensuring that we have quality data on persons with disability to understand, to even know exactly the number. And currently, I'm happy to say in Ghana here, Farida Bewe is leading the way, de developing the database on uh, persons with disability. And uh, I know um, I do communicate with her pretty soon. It, it will be launched out to make sure that we have quality data uh, on persons with disability to inform developers of exactly what is out there and how they can meet the needs of persons with disability. There is also the need for transfer of knowledge. And so when we invest and uh, we put more funds into research, then that transfer of knowledge can take place to help developers always be up to date in terms of what we need to develop for persons with disability. The quality data also as a country will help us because I know for instance in Ethiopia they have what we call the country capacity assessment where they try to understand the appropriate uh, needs of persons with disability and how to meet their needs. So I think that if every country should try to do that assessment needs, it will be helpful for developers who are also working hard to meet the needs of persons with disability. And on a whole, embodying a regional specific research um, when it comes to assistive technology on the African continent. Yes, Sarah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Millicent. Uh for that detailed answer. And then our final question is to Bernard. Um, uh, and that is, does mobile assistive technology lend itself to collaboration and partnership working? And should the global tech giants be actively supporting grassroots innovation? Bernard. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So, I mean, uh, for me, this is a question that is an obvious yes, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you have to look at mobile as ubiquitous. Everyone, uh, you know, it, it's literally the tool that um, if you compare this to the um, uh, Stone Age, I guess this is our stone for our age, right? Everyone is trying to use a mobile phone uh, because it's become uh, literally the device that uh, you can you can actually uh, do most functions on one device right like it's it's like a Swiss army knife now um, if, you, if, you, if you think back or take a step back and say okay so if everyone needs this Swiss army knife um, what does it mean for those who do not have access um, what does it mean when um, we create, uh, you know, a software uh, without thinking about, uh, you know, eighty percent of of, of uh, persons with disability. I mean, eighty percent um, of one billion people who are living in uh, the global south who um, are facing myriads of challenges uh, for making this device uh, work for them. So I think it's a perfect breeding ground for collaboration because. Um, I feel like sometimes the question of assistive technology stem or lack of access to assistive technology stems from the lack of understanding of why is disability inclusion good in the first place. And I think once a business, a country, you know, a household understands 
the value of uh, inclusion, um, it's a no brainer because it brings everyone to the fold. And if you're looking for economic progress, for example, Africa is a continent where uh, literally in Kenya, uh, the country's GDP, if you, if you, if you count um, the volume of money transferred via M-Pesa, literally it's almost the, country, the country's GDP. So um, when you think about it from a perspective of value, uh, and helping those who are not able to participate uh, come on board, then you start getting very, very different outcomes. Uh, and the beauty is that everyone has a role to play, you know? Um, this is a question for policymakers, and um, uh, it's, it's great that the work that GSMA is doing uh, to write reports that can help us understand the relationship between mobile and, and, and um, disability and assistive technology and I would encourage more industry players to do this because then we begin having numbers that we can look at then we begin understanding where the gaps are um, you know I had uh, Millicent mentioned uh, this idea about uh, country assessment and it's part of what the global disability innovation hub is doing to help countries understand you know where are we in this question of inclusion I would actually say it's an opportunity, not just for countries, uh, but for, you know, literally uh, everyone, businesses, uh, enterprises, you know, small businesses. Literally, if you think about the value of including persons with disability, then you will actually see the benefits of collaborating, which could make it, you know, uh, first of all, accessible. Once you're past the friction of access, then you enter the realm of empowerment. You know, you are talking about empowering um, everyone to access services, uh, to make use of products, and, and even really to access what they really need. Now, um, assistive technology obviously is a broad term that covers both digital and, and physical product, but mobile, um, you know, it's it's the easiest gateway to information. Nowadays, you don't need a, you know your laptop to go on Google or any other search engine to you know on the fly find out something. You know, find out what's happening or go on Twitter and follow trends. So I think when we we look at this, um, when you look at the potential of mobile from this perspective, then collaboration is a given because one we can unlock value for uh, people who have traditionally been excluded from participation. That value, it's possible to quantify it even into uh, a return on investment if you want it. There's a, a research recently done by at scale that actually shows the return on investment on assistive technology is nine to one. So, um, on to the question of big tech and their role uh, in, in, in actually making this happen. I think, you know, um, it's, it's, it's definitely needed, but I would say that, you know, it's a question of are we doing enough and do we have uh, a long-term view on how we can actually uh, make use of our modern day uh, Swiss knife or stone to actually uh, reach everyone. What I love about mobile is this concept of reach and connecting people. Um, and we cannot uh, celebrate the advancement of technology as it were, if a huge segment of society is not benefiting, is not having their needs met. And that is why at Innovate Now, the idea really is, um, We've always looked for solutions in the typical places, you know, government will, you know, give me, uh, charity will donate. But how about making our own solutions work for us? And I think that's why the power of uh, entrepreneurship and technology is one of the key ingredients in my view that needs to be supported in Africa to solve this problem because it's a huge problem. And we've seen... Um, this unlock other markets. So I don't think 
this is going to be different. You know, there's a time Africa was called a dark continent. But do you know right now, even in the most remote villages in Africa, you're going to find electricity. And that's why we've, it's because we figured how to unlock solar power, renewable energy, and how to make it uh, affordable. I saw the question of cost in one of the comments that cost is the biggest impediment. Uh, this can actually be broken down by innovating more frugally and actually embracing a business model innovation. There is a reason why today India is one of the leading uh, hubs in the world for many problems like healthcare. If you compare the cost of healthcare in India and many ad advanced countries, you'll actually find, you know, for a solution like dialysis uh, in, in India, it will be triple or uh, more in, in, ad in advanced economies in the West. And that's because they have chosen to actually innovate frugally and uh, take context into consideration. And I think that is the, the opportunity we have here. Mobile connects us all, but I think we have an opportunity to use mobile in a powerful way. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Bernard. Um, I, we had some, you know, kind of a back channel chat during the presentations. And I know that Nadav wanted to follow up with uh, comments of other panelists. So um, perhaps we'll allow a few minutes of panelist to panelist, uh, either questions or follow ups from other things that you have heard, and then we'll open it up to uh, audience queries. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and, and both to Millicent and Bernard. I, I want to be the chairperson for your friend club. So um, that's uh, tell me where, where to sign up. Um, two, two, several points. I told you, uh, Millicent, you mentioned the fact that um, knowledge for developers is key. And I totally agree. That is why in, in, in our view of how solutions should be developed, it should always be a participatory design process. You can, the, and the, you know, it's kind of a, already a cliche, but it's, it's so true that nothing about us without us, it makes sense. You cannot design a solution. It's not, Nadav, I cannot design a solution for someone sitting in a wheelchair without having a, a person in a wheelchair assisting me and advising me and leading the way for me. We actually coined the term for this. We don't just say people with disabilities. Uh, we actually say need knower. So it's not just a person with disability. It's a need knower. They, they have the need and they know. They might not know how to work a 3D printer or how to use a laser uh, cutter or how to hammer the nail on the right spot or what is the angle to connect two planks. But they know what type of solution they need. From there, we can also go to something much broader, and this goes into what you mentioned, uh, Bernard, into inclusive design. If we start by including people with disabilities in the design process of the original, not in the, in the third iteration, not in the fourth generation of cell phones or mobile devices of T or tablets or TV, smart TVs, but from the get-go, from the start of the innovation process to have people with disabilities as core members of every design team, we can actually not just create the solution that is suitable for them, but is suitable for the entire population and is better for the entire population and for future generations to come. One super crucial thing that I, I wanted to mention is also we should have in mind um, always the caretakers uh, of um, and the support staff that work together with people with disabilities, the occupational therapist and the physical therapist, for example. These are knowledge-based individuals and societies, associations that really carry the heavy, heavy load of day in and day out, working with rehabilitation centers, working with people, helping them overcome their difficulties. Um, and I think they have tremendous knowledge and they should be definitely part of the conversation um, when we talk about assistive technologies. I've seen it all around the world. 
today, occupational therapists and rehabilitation centers are trained to work a 3D printer because they need to be able to actually create a solution for an individual in their care center. Um, and it happens, thankfully, more and more in really all around the world. In Latin America, it happens. In Asia Pacific, it happens. In Africa, it's, it's happening. Um, and like Bernard, I think Bernard was the one who mentioned this. These problems are not Africa specific. They might have an Africa context for sure, um, but it's not Africa specific. These are problems that are global in nature. The, the, the disability in Africa is the same disability in, uh, in Asia or in Europe or in America. Um, it is the same disability. The context might be different. The access might be different but the disability is the same. So we always have to have that global perspective in mind that we're incorporating and we're addressing global issues um, and then going down a notch and actually bringing down, you know, uh, the specific context of, of, each, um, of each continent, country, region, city, uh, town and village. Um, and I think to, to sum it up, I, because I, and most of my career, I've been in policy and I've done extensive policy both at the UN and the Israeli parliament. I actually, from my experience, I would love to just work with communities. I hate for people with disabilities to wait for a policy to be drafted, enacted and implemented. University students, university professors, engineering labs, professor, um, retirees, professionals in corporates. There is so much talent and knowledge and ability to create solutions. We don't have to wait for policy. Policy will follow, um, hopefully, but we shouldn't wait for policy. We have to do community work. Through community work, we can actually succeed in helping one, helping many. Document your solutions, make them available, um, help others. That's, that's the motto, that's Tikkun Olam. I think we're all subscribed to this. It's nothing, uh, you know, it's nothing unique. Um, it's the most general thing one can aspire to. So um, just a few thoughts that I had to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do other panelists want to add additional comments or comment about um, other speakers? questions or answers before we go out to the uh, some of the questions from the floor. Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah, I think I can add something or, or just kind of piggyback Nadav on this idea of uh, participatory in innovation. Uh, so, you know, you know, uh, you know, accelerator, we actually call this live labs and, and we challenge uh, any entrepreneur or innovator to actually validate, uh, you know, whatever they are building uh, with the need and over. And this is, uh, for me, it's a powerful um, uh, concept because you're actually uh, evolving the role of a need and over to a solution provider. And that shifts uh, the thinking completely because for a long time, uh, we haven't gone to persons with disability to involve them in, in the solutions that we build. Um, and, you know, just as, you know, we tell startups that you need to talk to customers uh, when you're building solutions, it's, it's the same case. So that's a powerful concept. And I hope we can find a way. My dream is to have a connected need knower network, you know, that kind of helps uh, this participation at, at, at a global level. And I hope we can figure out something with Nadav and other like-minded people. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Melissa? Yeah. yeah. Hello, Sarah. I'm here. I, I think I agree with what Nadav and Bernard have said. Very excellent uh, points that they've raised. And uh, again, I will also emphasize on what just Bernard ended about the development process. If we want to develop assistive technology like any other product you've been developing, I think it's become very problematic. 
Okay, so we have the knowledge, we have the technical know-how, we have the super technology and everything. We are AI experts and we sit in our room and we design assistive technology. This is a problem. And so we must involve persons with disability and it shouldn't be at the testing stage for us to go and do retrofitting. We have to involve them from the onset. When you come to my outfit here at Inclusive Tech Group, when we are having capacity building training for the blind, I have a blind volunteer. He's the one who takes them. He has the expertise. He's good at that. I am physically challenged, but I cannot do it as best as he does. So though I'm a computer scientist with PhD qualification and everything. So we must let the right people do the right job when it comes to assistive technology. That is very important. Currently, we're mobilizing to um, have a hackathon, a disability inclusive hackathon. And I said, look, if your team, you don't have a person with disability in it, you cannot even apply. Because how are you going to bring an innovative solution for somebody who is not part of it? And this is where the inclusivity comes in. And so think together with a person who is disabled. If you say you want to develop something for the deaf, in your team, have a deaf person, then I can believe that you bring in a workable solution. And so I think that is a way to go, making the right people do the right job, not because we don't have the knowledge, but because they can do it better. Excellent, great. Thank you very much. Um, we'll open up to some of the uh, questions that have come in through the Q&A forum. Uh, let's see, one here is for Google. And so first let's make it clear, I don't speak for the big Google here. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give my limited, uh, my limited view. Um, and so the question is, Google is Google looking to localize its voice technology to make it more Africa forward and therefore useful for us? Our African accents are not recognized on your platforms. So Google has, of course, its big strategy in terms of making sure that it's covering more and more languages across the world and accents as well. Given our particular initiative in terms of how do we really do more to develop in emerging markets, all I could say is we will be advocates for this, identifying where there are gaps and um, and you know and and encouraging. Um, that these get higher priority if they're not already in the higher priorities. And also in light of a lot of the things you've already heard today, we look forward to working with local talent. To what extent could we do that in collaboration in terms of you know, adding languages or, or doing a better job of addressing accents? Um, moving on, there's a question for um, Bernard. Uh, let's see. Um, and it was, what are the key challenges you face um, uh, shipped? And I think it was actually specifically for Kenya. Uh, da, da, da. We have lots of questions here and now I'm losing it. Ah, what are the key challenges you might face in shifting people to the new technology in Kenya? And I don't know if you could speak also beyond Kenya, um, given that we have so many countries represented here, whether the issues are shared across countries, but the question was geared towards you, key challenges that you may face um, in shifting technologies. Yeah, so I think, you know, there are obviously many challenges when it comes to this topic, but I think how I'd love to um, uh, share about this is typically what happens when you're trying to take a new technology or a new innovation to market. You know, initially, there's going to be a small group of people who understand what you're doing and who can relate uh, to this. Um, uh, typically, it will be other, you know, innovators or people who are in research. But the whole idea is really to go, um, you know, to mass adoption, you know, to go beyond that small group of people and convince everyone that this is an opportunity, it's viable, and this is why it's good and why we all need to adopt it. I think we're at a place uh, for assistive tech uh, where we're just about to start trying to cross that chasm uh, and help everyone around us understand what it is that we're saying about the power of assistive technology. And this is something we want to demonstrate to investors 
uh, in this market because startups in this market or innovators in this market are obviously having a difficult time in securing early stage investment. And it's understandable when you're talking about a market that has not been proven or is not traditionally known as, you know, in, in Kenya, the most maybe a popular market is fintech. Everyone has a different way to pay and to send money for something. Yeah. So we're talking about, you know, hold on, guys. How about life changing technology? You know, how about that? So I think, you know, investors obviously look at things from a, you know, return perspective. They want to know how long their horizon is. They want to know how, how long it's going to take them to get their money. So we have to figure out new ways of financing assistive tech that allow us to actually build the foundation and then unlock commercial capital as we go. Um, we obviously have problems around, you know, uh, policy and the enforcement of policy. You know, Kenya is one of the most progressive countries in Africa when it, when it comes to uh, laws and policies, uh, you know, for its for people and human rights. We actually have a disability act that dates back to 2003. So, you know, policy will never be up to date, and that's something we've accepted. And I think I agree with the Latav, where, you know, it's how do we help policy catch up to be an enabler and not a, a disabler? Because we need new policy that can actually, you know, uh, incentivize infrastructure and resources uh, for uh, assistive technology. Uh, the question of manufacturing for me is key. If a country cannot manufacture, then it's not sustainable. And I think we saw this during COVID-19 when the borders were closed. So we have to think about the needs of people and the capabilities to meet these needs uh, from a manufacturing perspective and create those industries. And I think that is what um, you know, pioneers um, in Kenya who are actually at cottage industry level, but they are doing manufacturing in their own small way. So the question is, how can we invest more into that industry, uh, bring in new, new cheaper technologies like 3D printing uh, that can be leveraged to make, you know, assistive, check, assistive technology more affordable. And, you know, we've done clinical trials at GTI Hub uh, on, on, for example, use of assistive technology and prosthetics. And it's, I mean, it cuts down the costs, you know, almost by half. Uh, but as long as, you know, we have to import all the parts, as long as, you know, we have to uh, pay heavy uh, taxes attached to, you know, materials that are required uh, to, do, to, to manufacture assistive tech, then we're still going to have a problem. And I think lastly, for me, it's really changing the mindset. That is the most difficult. Because the moment everyone understands the power of inclusion, it's going to be easy to convince uh, resources, to convince partnership, to convince, um, you know, uh, participation of persons with disabilities. And I think that is where we have to do a lot of work to show the benefits and the value of building an inclusive world. And I think this is what this conference is doing for us here today. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, so another another sort of you know big broad question that probably covers many uh, um, you know African countries here, and some of it you've answered, and some of it certainly let's say with your references to three D printing, and uh, um, to, to, to the 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 questions shift. So my. Uh, um, so the question is, what's the way forward in solving some of these bigger, broader assistive technology issues, data charges, access to the internet, lack of expertise, funding, et cetera, because supply does not meet demand. Again, I know you've addressed some of these already. If there's anything in addition that you would like to add. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead, Nada. If I may, I know I know it's not out of my topic ish, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try anyway. I think, listen, access to internet is something that um, 
you've been speaking about um, at least in the in, in you know in the African um, and not just in the African context actually. But prior to living coming back to Israel, I was living in New York, and Sarah, as an American, can attest to that that access to internet is a huge issue as well in in the United States in uh, rural communities and remote communities. Uh, if you go to if you go inside of the country instead of just the coasts on the east and the west internet access is scarce sometimes not existent at all um, the only solutions that i am familiar with that will actually allow that access is satellite um, internet this is something that i know we had a speaker from facebook at the uh, uh, beginning and i think facebook was do doing something really amazing with um, deploying internet um, satellite internet across um, uh, across Africa. I don't know what's the status of that, so maybe we can ping her to come back um, and provide us with some answers to that. But I think that will also, as we increase access to internet, the charges actually would drop. Um, it allows companies to, um, it, the more bandwidth you have, you can share with your clients, the less charge you would have to take from everyone. Um, and I think specifically in Kenya, if I'm not mistaken, the situation is actually pretty good. Um, and maybe there's a specific example to, uh, to that that, Bernard, maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, um, so very quickly, I think, you know, I think one of the ways to look at technology is technology is an equalizer. And it actually, I mean, if you look at the spirit upon which the internet was built um, and taken to market, it's such that everyone could participate. So it kind of democratizes access, uh, which is which is the key thing here. So I think we live in, a, in an age, even though we are having all these problems with all these other things, the one thing that nobody has a monopoly of is knowledge. Uh, and that's because of the power of broadband and internet uh, as an enabler for that knowledge to reach people. And I think one of the things that Kenya, uh, you know, has gotten it right is really investment, uh, like heavy investment for connectivity, uh, because that's actually the backbone upon which you can do all these other amazing things uh, that can generate value. And of course, this is an area where government has to kind of play a strong role, but it's also an area for public-private partnership because, you know, for businesses like Facebook or Netflix or, you know, it's, it's in their interest that, you know, we have connectivity everywhere because then everyone will be able to participate in their business. So I think, you know, when you look at technology from that perspective, uh, and its role as an enabler, then it, it, it is foundational and it's uh, a point uh, that needs great investment. I think in Kenya we've done even experiments with balloons to, to take internet to very remote places. Um, and and I, 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 I think the plug was pulled on that project, if I'm not wrong, um, for reasons I, I don't know myself. But I think we have to, the, the message here is we really have to think outside the box on how we could actually deliver internet to everyone. Uh, because, you know, technology is improving exponentially, including connectivity. Now we are talking of 5G, which is already being piloted in Kenya, by the way, and uh, I think will be rolled out by, by Safaricom soon. So, um, when we look at this, uh, you know, investments in technology and the role of technology as an enabler, then we have to think about how do we leverage on this great power for our sector, for disability inclusion, because that's, that's something we have to get right because it's a gateway to the future. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. And okay. Melissa, it looks like you have a couple yeah. of final words and then we're going to need to wrap up. Yes, um, I, I think uh, Nadav and Bernard have made very important points, but at the back of that, um, you know, many are times we talk about 
access, access, and access. But I want to emphasize on quality access because the quality is very important. Because, you know, there are places you make argument governments, oh, there is access, but the quality of access is a problem. And most of this technology, if you don't have very quality internet connectivity, you, you cannot harness the benefit the way it's supposed to be. And so we must emphasize on quality. Again, the quality of device. So yes, there is quality internet access, but which kind of devices are being used to access that? That's also another question. And so we need to address both ways and plus education. We cannot rule education out, particularly when it comes to persons with disability who for a long time were marginalized and you know, deny access to education, especially in this part of our world. And so education is important. Uh, most of our trainings um, we do, you realize that, especially for the deaf persons at university level, but their literacy level in terms of digital literacy, it's quite low. And somebody will say, oh, now they have access to education. They are even in the university, but that is not enough. Their digital literacy level is very low because you go to the university, they don't have the resources that they need to learn when it comes to um, computing and even talk less of a sign language interpreter to access, um, to be able to assist them, you know, in terms of their learning. And so, yes, the quality is important, the quality of device important, and then the education, always the backbone. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of the panelists um, for their commitment to this important topic uh, and also for this uh, spectacular discussion and look forward to having it continue, if not in Inclusive Africa and all the other fora that we have available. So thank you.